So it's here's not heresy. It's come on. No, it's Harris' son. Wow! They gave us nothing but tradition and no argument. All they did was get on this stage, yell real loud, and set a straw man on fire. Okay, uh, this is... I, I... I was... not impressed. <laughs> Respectfully, that sounds like a little bit of a dodge. I'm claiming victory. So where I come from, extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. Why is this so difficult? I'm not... Greetings and welcome to another edition of Trinity Radio. I'm John the President. Along with me is Braxton Hunter. And today we're going to talk about unfundamentalism. And if we're that or something. This is the first word. Mere mockery. Mockery is an incredibly powerful tool of persuasion. Sometimes it's warranted, but usually it's not. Even when it is, mockery should be combined with good reasons to reject whatever is the supposedly absurd position. Recently, I've noticed a dramatic increase in the mockery of the Christian faith. Statements like, I can't believe people still believe in the supernatural in the 21st century. I guess some adults still can't give up their imaginary friend and other obnoxious refrains. What's different now is that even the least knowledgeable of the ever-present internet atheists once felt it necessary to provide reasons for this degree of mockery, and some still do. But the majority, including many of the popular internet atheists running video channels, are light on responses to the evidence and heavy on the mockery. Because this overblown, misplaced confidence can be powerful and persuasive, we would do well to recognize mere mockery for what it is. It is more or less an emotional appeal. We shouldn't accept or reject positions based solely on emotion. We should be moved by evidence. Anything else rightly deserves to be mocked. And now, today's topic. And welcome back to the main show. Mm -hmm. We're so glad that you're here at Trinity Radio. You've made the correct choice. And today, first of all, I just want to say, Jonathan, I love our patrons. Don't you I love do, our patrons? Yes. Um, we wish there were more of them, in fact. We love them so much, right? Yes, yeah, so that we could have <laughs> higher, so we can steadily increase our production value ah, here at Trinity. And, uh, it actually serves a purpose. Yes, in And fact, helps fund our road trips to go do the Lord's work. At, yeah, outside and of like I was doing in Sarasota, Florida just yes. this past week. Uh, five services in a weekend. Um, I... Um, if you'd like to become a patron, just just last week we purchased some new software that yeah. allows us to uh, be more cool, like these guys on that that critique Layton other Flower. videos. Just say Leighton Flowers, yeah, and so we so, can be cool like Leighton yeah, Flowers. That's what everyone wants, and so um, well, they want us to talk about Calvinism all day long, like Leighton Flowers. Yeah, but well, and uh, but here's the thing, that costs money. And we are, are trying to do the best that we can. If you'd like to be a patron, thank you so much to our patrons. Thank you for all that you do for us. If you'd like to be a patron and have us thank you as well, click up here somewhere and uh, you'll you'll see there's a little icon thing that you can click and it will give you the opportunity to do that. If you're listening by audio only, you can visit us uh, at tr uh, patreon.com slash trinity radio and you can give there. Yeah, thank if, you. If Braxton is the type of person that you would actually once a month buy his weird flavored ice cold coffee from this little store down here yeah uh then give five bucks if uh on the other hand that you think he's only worth a dollar like give me. a dollar give a dollar we'll take it or if you think i'm worth a dollar and he's worth 10 give 11 dollars yeah there you go. um all right so what we're going to do today is we're going to talk about the unfundamentalist movement i asked dr pritchett if he was aware of the unfundamentalist movement and he said no but he said he thinks he likes it because he uh doesn't want to go by the moniker or he does go by the moniker fundamentalist yeah, I well, no, I don't like it. Oh, why is that? Because uh, because it's going because you are a fundamentalist. Well, in a sense, I mean, in a sense, we all are, but we'll get to that in a minute. But I, yeah. I don't like this. Oh, I don't want to be called a fundamentalist. Mm -hmm. God forbid we affirm the fundamentals of the Christian faith. Right. Well, obviously, for those of you new to the show, uh, w the reason he says that is because uh, is because you know he wants to affirm the fundamentals of the faith. But the fact is, most people who decry the term fundamentalist are are decrying the package deal of all the particular doctrines and social affectations that go along with 
the phrase. Well, if they're, divi- if they're denying, the, if they're rejecting the doctrines, then they're going to go to hell. Well, right, but the particular <laughs> doctrines, the particular doctrinal positions that are not fundamentals, right? Like a particular view of end times, a particular view. There's of certain- five fundamentals published in twelve volumes that was an apologetic effort to counter liberalism that was increasing in America. Fundamentalism has gotten a bad rap in culture, and it has gotten a bad rap continuously, not from unbelievers, by the way, but from the snotty elitist evangelicals, conservative evangelicals, like, yeah, I mean, we affirm the fundamentals, but the fundamentalists, they they kind of retreated. Retreated? Really? It was started to, as an apologetics movement, to, to counter liberalism. It's not a retreat. But they, and they're like, oh, well, they just... They, they fundamentalists they decided to be angry and bitter and they all they did was argue about secondary and tertiary issues now people like Russell Moore has said this kind of stuff but evangelicals are all about the gospel and we're all about cultural engagement except the people at, at fundamentalist churches whether they're the IBF types you know or the KGB only yeah I understand there's a lot of cultural baggage there but Real fundamentalists, like your dad is a fundamentalist, and your mm-hmm. dad had me preach on the five fundamentals for five weeks in a row. Which makes you a fundamentalist. Yeah, and and, and I'm like, well, wait a minute now. Okay, so Zondervan has, is up to like 30-some-odd counterpoint stuff, mm-hmm. and the Internet exists. Mm-hmm. And you want to tell me that fundamentalists argue about secondary and tertiary issues all day long and not spread the gospel? Fundamentalists go still door knock along with the Mormons and the Jehovah's yeah, Witnesses right. while evangelicals sit on Facebook and fight about secondary and tertiary issues. And I, I in defense of doctrine by Ryan Putman is a 99.9% perfect book. Hmm. It is a great book. But I took him to task over one thing and he agreed with me. I took him over task when he made a the typical comment about fundamentalism versus evangelical. And it was a throwaway line that had nothing to do with the book. And I hope in the second edition, if he just removes that one little throwaway statement. It's a perfect it's book. It's a perfect book. Great it's a, book. It's inerrant. <laughs> <laughs> well, there are inerrant phone books. But, right, that's right. But, but I was so, just saying, but but the wait caricature wait is I'm afraid false. you're going to ruin it. I'm afraid yeah. you're going to ruin it because everything you just said, mm-hmm. I mean, that, that was, you can tell when someone is genuinely passionate about something because yeah. they say the whole thing without any uhs or ums or breaks. And as we know about you, you are proud that you occasionally use filler words like uh and um. But what you just spilled out all over Trinity Radio was like a perfect thread of thought that just hit the mark, I think. I don't... I want to capture it. Yeah, I want to cut I, it I don't loose. um and uhs when I'm angry. When I'm being just thoughtful, then? a little bit, because I get so sick of these these evangelicals I'm, yabbing about yeah. oh, how awful fundamentalists are. When evangelicals, everything they claim about fundamentalists, they're like twenty times worse. So I'm gonna cut out that piece that I mm-hmm. like that you just gave, and we're gonna make that a separate video that people can share around because it was fantastic, and the mm-hmm. evangelicals need to hear it, right? They right. do. Conser- and I'm not talking about liberal even. I'm talking about the conservative evangelicals who whine about. The fundamentalist movement of the of a bygone era, when the fundamentalist movement was a great thing, and the fundamentalists still today, like Randy White, uh, our yeah. friend Randy White out in Ta- Taos, New Mexico, wherever. Anyway, uh, he, he he still waves that flag, and he's evangelistic, and he's and we're he, taking the, he knows. we're taking it back, yeah. right? We're taking the label back. I don't. Yeah, I don't mind. I mean, I I like. Austin's label. I, the Paleo Baptist thing I'm cool with, but I mean, a fundam- you can be a fundamentalist Paleo Baptist. Yes, you can. You can be a fundamentalist evangelical, but you shouldn't be all buy into this this bogus idea that all oh, those fundamentalists are just a bunch of cranky old coots that sit around and bicker all the time. No, that's evangelicalism now, and it's worse than fundamentalism ever was. Yeah. Anyway, okay, yeah. I'll, I'll settle down. All right, so the unfundamentalist movement, because we're going to run an experiment today. We're going to find out whether Dr. Pritchett is actually an unfundamentalist and whether I am, because for those that don't know, this is a somewhat growing movement. There's something like 125,000 people in this Facebook group or whatever, unfundamentalist. And I'm not sure who originally coined the term, but there are several different groups that are similar that have these same little you know things about them. Um, there's a Christian unfundamentalist group, and then there's just a, in general, religious unfundamentalist group. There's unfundamentalist Buddhists and I guess Muslims and whatever. So, but here are some, but here's the thing. I see it on people's Facebook feeds who I know who are 
who are uh, Christians, but they're like left-leaning Christians, mm-hmm. and they'll put like the little the little thing up there that'll say something like, uh, "Just so you know, Jesus never said anything against homosexuality and and you know, stuff like that." That's the sort of thing you get. And so what we're what we're going to do is first I'm going to give you four points. Now there was something like a ten point a list of things that are commonalities to unfundamentalists. There were four that I thought were obviously problematic in some way or other, and I'm going to read those so that people people know. Now, we're going to go through a list of, of 10 things that might mean you're a fundamentalist Christian parent. But you mean an unfundamentalist? An unfundamentalist, unfundamentalist. Christian parent. But I'm going to read these four so you know that we're not picking on otherwise perfectly normal, fine people, right? And they might be fine people, but you know what I mean. Okay, so here are the objectionable things I saw on a list that is kind of held up as one of the uh, you know, big deals. So God can handle converting people. Our job is to love people. Now, technically, is that true? Yes. But one of the, pro- one of the things that unfundamentalists uh, push is this idea that you shouldn't really be trying to overtly evangelize people. Really? Including your own children. So... Unlike the Calvinists who are evangelistic, even though non-Calvinists say, "Well, if you were consistent, you you would do, people would just get elect," mm-hmm. and it, 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 which is dumb because Calvinists understand that God uses means, and one of the means is go and preach the gospel. Mm-hmm. And as uh, non-Calvinists, we believe that we also go and preach the gospel. So this is like worse than the worst caricature. Aha, uh-huh, but of what they'll say is they're taking back evangelism. Because they actually say it that way. We're taking back evangelism because the way they're going to do it kind of under the hood. One of the one of the statements said something like you don't have to mention the name of Jesus to be a Christian or something like that. And so they're wanting really? to kind of slide it under the table. Uh, you know, and that's their form of evangelism, oh, by so just loving people. deceptive evangelism, and then spring it, ha, got you, we're really Christians. <laughs> Great, know. deceitful evangelism. I don't know, by Good the job. way, by the way, let me just say this. Yeah, that's wicked. I can see some people that are in our sphere mm-hmm. being into this, not, not that particular thing, but into these kind of groups, because, so, if I am mischaracterizing any of this, I don't think I am. But feel free to let me know, okay? Are we right or are we wrong about unfundamentalist Christianity? But I want, but I want to lay out what I've discovered from this and my experience with it, and from looking at their about statements on their unfundamentalist sites. Okay, yeah, right. so God can handle converting people. Our job is to love people. Yes, our job is to love people and to uh, evangelize and witness to them by using the name Jesus. See, to be the you, means God uses. What you to- don't do is you don't talk about. Yeah, you don't talk about. Oh, well, you know, we all have a—there's a light to the world, and this light is is something that we need to embrace. And then six months later, oh, by the way, when I, when I mean light, I mean, like, you know, Jesus. <laughs> no, what you say is, you know what? There's a light bulb. We have a light bulb in our studio. And you know what? Jesus is the light of the world. Did you know that? Yeah. <laughs> you yeah, know, you take right. everything to Jesus. Light yeah. bulbs, Jesus. Yeah, and now they, they, will, they will say at least— Light switch, most Jesus. Of the, most of the stuff that I did no, look at said— that they do believe Jesus is divine, so we got that going for us. All right, so that's thank God for that. Oh well, they one fundamental okay. down. Okay. <laughs> okay. Well, there's more. There's more stuff you'd agree with. We'll get there. Uh, there is no support in the Bible. This is another objectionable statement. I think there is no support in the Bible for the morally repugnant idea that hell is an actual place to which God sentences people to spend eternity in mortal agony. Except for what Jesus said <laughs> about it. Right. Yeah, like even annihilationists, right? Even right. even conditional immortality people believe there's an actual hell. Yes. At least m- many of them do. Um, and, and that you will suffer there. Even universalists you could, you believe. You can call it mortal agony. <laughs> yeah, even universalists believe that there's a hell. It's right. just that eventually over the eons of eternity, it'll be emptied out. Right. Maybe. Yeah. Uh, at least evangelical universalism. Yeah. So this is beyond this. Just, well, I mean, there's no hell. Yeah, so here we go. The belief that throughout history, God chose to introduce himself in different ways into different cultural streams is more reasonable, respectful, and compassionate than is the conviction that there is only one correct way to understand and worship. God. Thoughts? Now, are, you don't are, have to disagree. No, what you I'm might saying. Agree. Are, are they saying this is Christianity, right? This is this is this is Christian uh, uh, un, unfundamentalism. So they're saying God has contextualized the gospel of Jesus in different ways, right? Well, yeah, but I think what they mean, I think I think this is like a pluralism type move. Oh, ridiculous! Yeah, absolutely absurd. Guess okay. what? 
unless you're a Christian, you're going to go to hell, uh, which is a place where you either will have your face melt off for all eternity, like the ending of Raiders of the Lost Ark, or you'll have it melt off until you're completely obliterated, like the Annihilationists say. Either way, it's bad. So, um, well, or it's it's the the view that even the traditional eternal conscious suffering bit is true, but there's not actual flames. That's a view. Okay, the eternal conscious separation anxiety yeah. view of hell, yeah. which yeah. I think is. Yeah. Eh. Anyway, but, wait. Are you currently are you currently uh, uh, like a, a fryer furnace type guy? Like where there's there's fire and and like literal fire. Is that is that your position? I didn't think that was your position. I don't have a position. You're a I'm just not. Yeah, I'm, I'm a proud fencer, but I'm I'm just like no matter where you go, I don't like. I it's don't bad like either the, way. That's the point yeah, you want to make. But I just was so soft selling the anti fire thing that you just sit around sad in hell all the time. No, it's going to be a little bit worse than that. Oh yeah, you know uh, whatever you think hell is, if the biblical authors are to be believed including the voice of Jesus as he's captured in the Gospels, you don't want to go to hell. Yeah. It's going to be terrible, and whatever you think you can put on it to uh, uh, characterize it rightly, it's worse than that, yeah. I think. It is be- and he uses in hell as if it's a, a referent not to a state, but to a location, Yeah, right? And, and the fact that the Valley of Hinnom is also a location for which he is using a metaphor, he means location. Mm-hmm. Wherever that is, I don't yeah. know. But I'm just saying, that's, that's what he means, is going to be bad. And if you're not a Christian, you go there. Yep. Right? Yep. Now, that gets into what about the unevangelized and all Let, that Let's stuff. not go there because we've right. got to get through this. We have a, we're we not have, even to the list yet. Right. This is just me familiarizing But people. the idea of religious pluralism is nonsense because Jesus eliminated that possibility in John 14, mm-hmm. 6. So here we go. The biblical scholarship supporting the idea that Paul never wrote a word condemning natural homosexuality is more credible and persuasive than is the scholarship claiming that he did. Moreover, we remain mystified as to how any follower of Jesus could choose damning an entire population over obeying Jesus' great commandment to love God and one's neighbor as oneself. We affirm the love, yes, but the attempt to rewrite Paul... Right. Is, is now, lacking. this is interesting because there was a big thing about uh, the president of the Southern Baptist Convention giving a sermon on Romans 1, for example, where Paul really highlights this issue. Mm-hmm. And uh, in the discussion, I don't want to, I don't, that's a Southern Baptist thing, and you're tired of me talking about that. But uh, in the context of the discussions where people are like, oh, yeah, well, I mean, it's kind of right. You know, I mean, all sins are equally sinful to God. No, that's not true. All sins are equally damnable. One's, you know, one sin, and you're, cast right mm-hmm. you, you need mm-hmm. you need saved mm-hmm. but the punitive damages in the law gives us a yes that's absolutely right yeah there in in the law which does give us an impression of god's yeah. opinions about things there are different kinds of sacrifices different levels of severity in the punishment right jesus said the least of these commandments so there's a hierarchy right. there. so and there's an obvious difference in the impact in your life out of, right. if, if I tell a lie about my weight, okay, that's a sin, I yes. think. But it doesn't have the major destructive impact to multiple people as if I got a divorce without a good reason. Or you killed somebody. Or I killed somebody. So, so yeah, and then the fact that you're repaid each according to his works, some, some people are going to get it worse than others, and some sins, yes— while all sins are equally damnable, they're not all equally wicked. Yeah, Some is, are really more this, this wicked. This is the way I put this. it. If you got a clean carpet, let's say it's light blue, clean carpet. If you drop one drop of grape juice on the carpet, is the carpet dirty? Yes. If you dump a gallon of grape juice on the carpet, is the carpet dirty? Yes. In both cases, the carpet is now stained. But one stain is a heck of a lot worse than the other stain in terms of the ramifications. All right, so here it is. Well, hang on, hang on, hang on. But I, I do want to point this out about that, Okay. okay? In um, Romans chapter 1, verses 26 through, where does it go, Um, 26 and 27, okay? Verses, that's two verses that Paul spends on that issue of people exchanging the natural, Yeah. okay? And, and where then, are you? Which, where are you? Is Romans this, 1. Okay, Romans 1, yeah. And, 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 and then, okay. This is then, where he specifies the act, not the nature of the relationship. Yeah. But then he spends two verses in, in uh, 29 and 30 giving the laundry list. 
yeah. greed and idolatry and slanderers and haters of God and arrogant and all that, inventors mm-hmm. of you, all that stuff, right? So two verses on a laundry list of things, but you also have two verses on one specific issue. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so you're just saying pound for pound on verse count. Paul was zeroing in on that thing yeah. in particular. So yeah. to write it off as, well, that's not, I mean, he's not talking about loving stuff. No, he's talking, uh, okay, here are two ways you can look at it. He's talking about men and women having sexual relations with people of the same, the same gender. gender. Okay, I cares if you're gay or straight, don't do that. Mm-hmm. Because it's Paul sees that as wicked, and it's something he highlights over two verses compared to the other two verses where he runs through a laundry list. You can't mm-hmm. just say, well, that's just part of that laundry list. No, he spends a little bit more time than just mentioning it in passing. Yeah. Right? So uh, the thing is... If you're going to be a Christian who claims the Bible right. as an authority, you just got to deal with what the Bible says. Right. But that's one thing that these unfundamentalists will sometimes say is that the Bible evolve, the meaning of the Bible evolves with culture, evolves with us. And it doesn't have to mean one thing. And they usually throw in the mistake there about it's not necessarily all to be taken literally. Well, nobody thinks that it is all to be taken right. literally. Right. But anyway, so... But, you know, but they, my point is, I mean... The, but they are saying there, yeah. Paul is to be rightly understood as only condemning unnatural homosexual acts when he's not at all talking. He, he'd be fine, probably, they're saying, with like loving monogamous same sex. Oh, was that the original intent? I thought we shouldn't go by that because it <laughs> changes. Right. You get that's what I'm saying. They, there's a there's a wishy washy Right. Here. But but the point is is okay, say it's he he's he's talking about the acts period. It doesn't matter if you're homosexual and it's what you think is a natural inclination of a person which is still an open question. Uh, but here's the thing. Yeah, nobody thinks that you should be horrible to homosexual people or the LGBT. Nobody believes that. Right. So let's set that to the side. That doesn't mean that we can't condemn sin and this particular sin that is so rampant and on in your face and culture now, people say, oh, Christians just talk about this too much. Oh, no, we don't. They keep putting it out there, so we keep responding to it. Yeah. But sin is sin, and we don't get to, you don't get a free pass on that one just because it's popular in culture. So my argument is, if you're living in a culture where mass murder is a problem, you rebuke murder. Right. But if you're living in a culture that keeps pushing this agenda of acceptance, I don't have, you know, you have to push back against that. Yeah. Um, I don't hate anybody. I, I don't... Uh, We're saying what the Bible I, says. I, yeah, I don't want to, I don't want to op- oppress anybody, yeah. whatever. But I don't have to accept your lifestyle any more than you have to accept any sort of sinful right. lifestyle if I want to break into your house. Right. Yeah. And, you know? and so, so... I don't get it. Yeah. Let's move on. So here we go. This is 10 signs you're an unfundamentalist Christian parent. We're going to find out whether you are, Jonathan. Okay. We're going to take the test here. This is by Cindy Brandt, and this was posted in the Huffington Post. Uh, Cindy Brandt also runs... A well-respected news site by all, right? Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and Cindy Brandt also is the, I think, creator of the uh, Facebook group for unfundamentalist Christian parents. So this is... We're honing in. We're not just unfundamentalist Christians here. We're talking about parenting in this world. So let's find out if you are, Jonathan. One... Are, so you are an unfundamentalist Christian parent if you, one, are parenting with a shifting faith. And here's what that means. We all know there's a wide range of theological convictions under the big umbrella of the Christian faith, and the various doctrines are worth wrestling with in our own hearts and minds, as well as in civil dialogue with our communities. But unfundamentalist parents hold our variant convictions with an open hand, and most of us have had changes of heart in regards to doctrines we've held. We know faith is fluid and evolves, and some of the best things that have happened to our own faith is because we have had the courage to change our minds. Now, I'm not sure about some of the terminology there, but the idea that you're open to changing your understanding of particular tertiary doctrines. Yeah, fine. Uh, when I I'm, stopped, I'm fine with that. Oh, uh, well, I mean, when I stopped being a Calvinist, yeah, I did not consider that an act of courage. Well, okay. Like, well, look at me. I mean, yeah. I've rejected cessationism and I've rejected Calvinism and right. I've rejected eternal. Sur- I'm brave. Yeah. Well, no, it's you know okay. What? I'm like, but well, I just keep the that, point one. That's you terrible. have you have shift. You're you're open to changing doctrinal positions. Yes and no. If that's what we mean there. Yeah, no on the fundamentals, right? No on the fundamentals, <laughs> right. absolutely. Not. And when I teach my kids, we do devotional every night. 
okay? Or most, we try to do it every night. I'm proud of you. Yes. I hammer on the foundations of the historic Orthodox faith. Mm -hmm. And what I also do is, I, if an issue comes up, I give them the, the spread of these things are okay. Here's the views that are not okay, but th as far as this spread goes on this issue of spiritual gifts or whatever, here's the spread. Now, I want my kids to agree with me because I, I agree you, with myself right. and I think I'm right. That's right. Right? Yeah. But if they don't agree with me on some secondary matter, who oh, cares? You want your kids to agree with you about Jesus, though, right? Right, you're, and they do. You're, you're gonna... But I want my kids to have a thoughtful Christianity within the secondary and tertiary issues to know the field and to make up their mind. I can tell we're going to have major troubles with you then when we come to number four here in a minute. But, okay. Um, but so so I'm going to get, I'm going to put... So does that make me an unfundamentalist? We're going to get half a point. Let's give ourselves half a point on this one, okay? Because yes, we're open to changing doctrinal positions, but not fundamentalist doctrine, right. fundamental doctrinal positions. So I'm going to give us 0.5 okay. on that, each of us, okay? okay? We're going to tally it up at the end. Okay. Are uh, you okay? You might be unfundamentalist if you are a Christian parent who often has doubts. Unfundamentalist parents' parenting is to let go of certitude. We have seen the way certainty of absolute truth has caused harm to communities as human doubts are shut down and genuine questioning is swept under the rug. Because we all allow, because we allow room for doubts, we have moments of weak faith and perhaps even periods of loss of faith. Um, for me. Okay, the simple statement of the point is our Christian parents who often has doubts. I don't often have I doubts. I don't often have doubts. Um, but do I do I have ha, I think all Christians experience doubts depending on the nature of the doubt, right? Or the nature of the issue. So for example, sometimes I might doubt if Christianity is true. Not often, but sometimes. You I think right? you said once once a year or something. Yeah, once a year. For an hour. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I mean, but I mean, we have, doubt. Doubt doesn't, doesn't make you unfundamental; it makes you a human. Yeah. Okay, but insofar as Christianity being true, I have no doubt that what the apostles affirmed was a bodily resurrection, and I have absolute one hundred percent certainty that that's what they believed. Mm -hmm. Absolute certainty. I believe there is no possible convincing, compelling argument that they believed in some spiritual re re resurrection. Yeah. Like some ethereal. Resurrection. Yeah. No way. So what are we talking about? What do we doubt? And what's wrong with absolute certainty that I know for a historical fact, 100% fact, that Paul believed that mm -hmm. Jesus' body came out of a grave? And so did Peter. And so did Thomas. Yeah, there's this thing going around out there now so, that doubt is a virtue. That doubt is something that you, you should seek to doubt. And I wonder, do they doubt that principle? <laughs> you know, do, does this person doubt this point yeah. of their unfundamentalist perspective? Yes, I agree that there's a handy skepticism that we ought to maintain, a reasonable skepticism where I, with some things, though not everything, yeah. I think, I'm not sure, you know? Mm -hmm. I don't know for sure, or maybe I need to take a second look. But the idea that doubt is, an, is a goal in and of itself, I think is, frankly, silly. Well, yeah, doubt's not a virtue, it's an experience. You don't, you know, you don't call every experience virtuous, or, or no, no, noun, virtue. You don't call it virtue. Mm-hmm. It's just so, an experience. So are we so zero on this one? Now, yeah, because in order for doubt to be a virtue, doubt has to be an intentional thing that I'm going to go around and I'm just going to doubt my faith. Yeah, that's what that's I want well, to doubt that, my faith. No, that's what they're saying. These yeah, people, that, that's stupid. The, I'm not. No, now the unfundamentalists. I mean, they are treating doubt as virtue here, but I'm yeah. thinking of atheists who say doubt is a virtue. That like you should go around intentionally doubting things, you know. But as we pointed out. Uh, as we've pointed out many times, you don't do that in your daily life, no. like ever. Like we're sitting on this stool. <laughs> we Should I not, intentionally doubt this stool? Yeah, hold me wouldn't up. even cross our minds. I don't mm -hmm. doubt that I'm going to continue. My heart's going to continue pumping right now, <laughs> and it might not. <laughs> right. but especially as I continue to read this article, it will because I pray for you every day. Well, brother. thank you, brother. And God does answer your prayers because He likes you best, right? right. <laughs> Absolutely. Okay, so zero on that one. Or are we not taking any points no, on that's that one? Stupid. Okay. <sighs> You'll love this one. Three, reject, so you might be unfundamentalist if you reject hierarchical parental authority, especially as a spiritual mandate. Unfundamentalist parents are uncomfortable requiring children to submit to parents under harsh and strict discipline. Something in our gut tells us. I, I can't believe this is put, This is they just said it this way. Something in our gut tells us. This isn't what is best for our children. And when done in the name of God, it is even more suspect. 
We seek gentle parenting methods and believe the way of Jesus, one who gives up power as a better model in parenting. Yeah, let's eliminate Deuteronomy 6 from our Bible and some right. other passages. Right. Yeah, absolutely stupid. No, I get no points for no, this. Your kids have rules. They yes. live by those rules or they get in trouble. And, yeah, and no, not just behavioral rules, doctrinal rules. You yes. don't spew heresy in my house. Right. Unless you do it accidentally, right? I do it, do it in the, do it in the driveway because there might be lightning, and I like my house. Right, but I mean, it, you know, unless accidentally, you know, they get some sort yeah. of uh, uh, analogy for the Trinity wrong. Right, and they're, they're thirteen. Everybody does that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But I'm just saying, no. If they, I don't believe this because I think that, no, no. My kids have doctrinal standards they have to abide, and they have moral and behavioral standards. Yeah. And this is absolutely nonsense, and you wonder why kids are terrible. No hierarchical parental authority how are you going to instill and enforce that rule right <laughs> like that rule itself when you yeah. teach your kids now kids we're in friends. our family we're just friends in our we're family not. you need to understand that we do not have a hierarchy do you understand if you don't understand there's going to be consequences <laughs> we have no hierarchy and no punishments oh Stupid. all right stupid no points we're for just that one. friends we're not we're not authority figures in your life no that's yeah. absolutely ridiculous okay. you know why my dad was my best friend because growing up, he was my authority. Yeah. And I didn't like it when I was growing up all yeah. the time. But by golly, when I got grown, I realized, dang, you were right. Yeah. You know? That's and right. So, I don't know. There's, they're not opposed to one another. You can be friends and still have uh, honor your parents sure. as authority. Anyway. Yeah. Okay. yeah no, I, don't, I don't want to point on that. Uh, yeah. And I, it, I want them to change their mind about that because that's stupid. And I don't want to have to deal with your kids and culture. Yep. You know, my kids my kids get punished harshly, and you know what? Last night, yesterday morning, Jacqueline runs into my bedroom while I'm still in bed, which I hate, but you know what? I love her. She's sweet. <laughs> and she gives me a card that she made. She cut out a valentine, and, and she drew, like, a, a picture of the family and everything in there and gave me a piece of chocolate because I didn't want a piece of chocolate. I mean, I ate it, but <laughs> but that's her <laughs> of course thing. You did. That's her thing she could give, yeah. right? That night, the same day, that night, I get an envelope in my chair when me, me and my other daughter, we watch Lost together. That's our thing at night. She gives me this letter. I open it up, and it's and it's a letter she wrote to me about how much she loves me and how uh, you know I bring her donuts and, and flowers and things like that. It just means a lot to her. And when I she put in there, and when you let me stay up ten minutes late, you know later than I'm supposed to be or whatever. You know, she, I love you, Dad. And, and you know what? She got in. She gets in trouble. Not often. She's a good kid, but they get in trouble, and then they love you more yes. for because you give them structure and discipline. Ridiculous. Okay, yeah. four. Don't look I, at it. I, look. I, well, I, well hang gonna... on for a second, though. I'm still stuck on this. Your kids gave you candy. Yeah. See, it's the other way around in my house. You <laughs> are you have to loved. Give them candy. Yeah. Okay. Right, anyway, I want, you're not going to believe this unless you see it, Jonathan. Look at this. Don't try to evangelize your children. <laughs> When, Send your kids to hell is what they need to change that <laughs> to. But listen to how it says it. Listen to how it says it. And if you think that I'm I'm like not being cool, the, the first word is on mockery this week. And if it sounds like I'm mocking, remember in the you first word, say, I said mockery is sometimes okay right. if it's backed with evidence. Right. We're giving you both here. And I'm sorry, if I was talking to atheists or something right now, I might be nicer than this. But when I'm talking to Christians who should know better, and probably needs some hierarchical structure in their lives, yes. I'm going to be straightforward. All right, this is what they say, though. So don't try to evangelize your children. When Jesus says, welcome the little ones, he says the kingdom already belongs to them. You are an unfundamentalist Christian parent if you believe our children have just as much to teach us as we have to teach them. If you believe God gave our children such vibrant imaginations to help us think outside of the box, unfundamentalist Christians don't think of children as prone to evil and born sinners. But, ima but image bearers, born into an imperfect world, wired for struggle, we believe our children are our equal partners in ushering more peace, love, and justice into the world. Okay, now, there's a bunch of that that I agree with, and almost none of that had anything to do with the point that it's supposed to support or explain, don't try to evangelize your children. Well, do I, I have stuff to learn from my kids? Of course I do. Any parent who says they don't learn from their kids, yes, they have amazing imaginations. Yes, they're image bearers. Yes, they're wonderful. Now... Is it true that they don't aren't born with a sin nature? No, no that is not horrible true. Horrible theology. Have there. you been around kids? The person who wrote this, I don't know if they have kids. Mm -hmm. Anyway, the the thing about this is none of that stuff that I affirm that's in there. Yeah. None of that supports the claim. Don't try to evangelize your kids. Right, and more okay. Because so, my kids can teach me things. Listen. Yeah. My kids can teach me plenty 
Does that mean I shouldn't tell them not to smoke cigarettes when they don't know that? <laughs> right. of, no. Why? Because that's good for them to know not to smoke cigarettes. Right. This is the dumbest thing. Oh, the, it's poor, the, poor theology that kid. I mean, kids. You know, kids have a s- sinful nature. You know, uh, if we want to use that language, that they're trying to avoid. Okay, so I think that anything can teach you something. Yeah, including kids. Yeah, right. And kids can teach you things about God that they can illumine certain things. Yeah. Okay, kids are not just fodder for a preacher's sermon illustration. Right. Well, they are that. <laughs> I said not Jeff. Yeah, that's right. Uh, <laughs> but but this idea that you shouldn't instruct them in the faith because that is evangelism, and you know, now I understand in pedo baptism and in covenantal theology, you know, you should treat your kids as if they're believers until they make an actual profession of faith. Sure. Yeah, but you don't have to be covenantal to still do that. Right, I do that. Yeah. I talk about my daughters as though they're both Christians, even though I, currently Jacqueline hasn't yet made a profession of faith, and I'm paying attention to that. Trust me. Why? Because I do want to evangelize my kids. Yeah. Here, here's what irritates me most about this, and this happens even with people who are not unfundamentalist, and it so stresses me out or bothers me, and it is they're not treating Christianity as though it's true and real. Yeah. Because... Um, if you believe this is true and real, why do, why are you gonna why aren't you gonna say, don't teach your kids not to smoke cigarettes, let them experience life. They've got a lot to teach us. Well, who do you think you are to t- tell your kids not to smoke cigarettes? No, we're gonna tell them not to smoke cigarettes. Why? Because that is real. That is evident. It will kill you. Right? If Christianity is true, it's a whole lot more important that they embrace Christianity than that they not smoke cigarettes. A whole lot more. Cigarette smoking will end up getting you killed, perhaps, or at least unhealthy in this life. You know what? If you don't embrace Christianity, like you said earlier, there is hell to pay, right? So if you don't love your kids, yeah, don't evangelize them. If you do love your kids, evangelize your kids. What's wrong with you Christians? They read the Huffington Post for one thing. Well, yeah, I did too, but it was only because I was looking for something like this. To talk about. No, I mean, they buy into the <laughs> Huffington Post. Yeah, yeah, right. Okay. I mean, I read right. the New York now Times. Now, we both but had I don't a pretty healthy it. rant here, I think. Yes. Uh, all right, number five. So, no points. No. no point. we, all we've got so far. Point we're on five. Point number five, and we've got point five. <laughs> right. All right, here we go. Five. You're an unfundamentalist Christian if you think there's no such thing as other people's children. Now, don't freak out yet. Let me read the, res- the explanation. Children are precious everywhere, regardless of nationality, religion, sexual orientation, race, and culture. It is not okay if in order for our children to thrive, we have to buy them products made from child labor in another part of the world. Our liberation is bound up together. For our children to live a life of wholeness, we must also advocate for children everywhere. Now, here's here's what I want to say about... Let okay, me start, at first let me, I thought wait, they were going to talk about Plato's Republic. Okay, but... but, but, but <laughs> and I was about... But then, then they went in, the, we should care about kids. Right, okay. Great, okay fantastic. Yeah. Now, okay. Now here, but, but I got something to say about this. Okay. Yes. I'm giving it 0.5. I'm, why am I not giving it a whole one? D- of course I care about other people's kids, love other people's kids. Of course, in that sense, they should all be my kids. I should think of them all that way, love them like I love my kids. I want these kids. No, you shouldn't. I, I don't oh, want, God, no, you shouldn't. I don't, well, none of on. this. None of well, this. Well, I'm, I'm getting love, there. Okay. I'm getting there. I don't want to give my kid some product and my kid's happy for a minute before she stops caring about that dumb iPad or whatever. Yeah. When that iPad is made by, I mean, I'm not, I'm not attacking Apple. Name nameless off-brand uh, <laughs> device when it was made by some kid eating sludge chained to a table on the other side of the world. That's wicked. Okay. Yeah. I get it. Now, do I do it? Probably. I don't want to. That's a point of you know conviction for us because we believe in a structured hierarchy and we can be told that we shouldn't do certain wicked things. Right. Now, <laughs> but Amen. here's the thing. I don't necessarily want other people thinking of my kids as their kids. Because right. then they might spew this garbage. Some of it is garbage. Yeah. That we've been talking about to my kids. They may think they're mm. free to influence my kids. Yeah. When I'm not around, they may think it's okay to put philosophical ideas and moral ideas into their minds that I would not agree with, and that the Bible doesn't approve of. Yeah. So because they're still children, and we're still forming their minds to have a Christian worldview, so that they can take on the world when they get become adults. You don't want them feeding it to your kids now. Because it'll conflict with what you're trying to raise your kids, and you have a right to raise your kids however you wish. But I don't love other people's kids as much as I love mine. Period. I mean, that's true. Yeah. Yeah. 
but I, I love your wife, but I don't love your wife like I love my wife. Right, or I'll kill you. Right, you don't want me to love her that way. <laughs> right. She doesn't want me to love her no, that way. No, you're bald. No, I'm just kidding. Well, I, you always say that bald men are the sexiest or whatever. I don't then, say sexiest. Oh, but you don't? thank you, they are. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I say most attractive. Most attractive. All right. Oh, well, okay, well, no, is, it was Adam Barwood that had the shirt that said bald men. today in today's episode. I know. But, but look, <laughs> I, I care about... Um, I care about, care about child labor in foreign countries, yeah. but I don't, this is like, if I go to Walmart and I buy a product from Walmart, I have no idea if it was made by child labor or not. And I'm unfortunately, I'm not going to go research every little purchase I make to make sure it wasn't made by a child. Like, yeah. But here's what I well, will do that no, no one there will do. Mm -hmm. If child labor is as rampant in China as it is, then let's send in, uh, whatever means necessary to have it knocked off. But mm -hmm. since you're not a f on board with that, whether it's economic sanctions or military troops to go save the world's kids, mm -hmm. which I'm all for, and why not? It's yeah. evil. It's wicked. Let's let's try to get people to stop doing that. Um, but you know, failing that, I'm all about. Let's go. Let's go get them to stop. Okay. So we're now on number six. But We've got won't. one point so far. But I think you're gonna. I think we can both. I think we can both give this one a full point. I believe that we can. Let's let's see. You might be an unfundamentalist Christian mm -hmm. if you believe in gender equality. Here's the explanation. We don't want our daughters to grow up believing their only purpose is to marry a man and live in submission to him. We don't want our sons to be exposed to toxic masculinity. I object to the phrase toxic masculinity, okay? We don't want your boys to be boys. <laughs> right, really, you know. right. Ma toxic because that's a bad phrase. Who's boys talking about boys. toxic yeah. femininity? I agree that the thing that is called toxic masculinity, some of it, is horrific, okay? The idea that, but that's not, to that's not masculinity. That's, a, that's wickedness. Like right? abuse, like yeah. abusive men. Yeah, no masculine person that I know. Uh, but it's fine. It's fine. toxic masculinity. Whatever. If, uh, when it, if it, that I don't know what that means. You have but a if first it, word on this, or a last word, or I something. I do. The one with Zelda. Right. It was great. Yeah. But the thing that it is referring, to, I want to be clear here. The wicked things that men do that are often that are you know, usually men doing them. You mm -hmm. know, this kind of abuse, right? These, these kind of things, treating women like second class citizens. Whatever that, yeah, that's if you want to call that toxic masculinity, fine, whatever. I hate that. That's yeah. wrong. People need to repent. But I suspect with the way this article's gone, they mean a little more than that when they say Probably. toxic masculinity. But anyway, I'm still I think we can still get a point out of this. Where they must where they must prove themselves strong and egotistical and never show emotions. We don't want our girls to be shamed for not looking like the bodies in magazines or our boys to be shamed for their developing sexuality. We want to deconstruct toxic and rigid gender roles and fight for a world in which our children grow to be men and women who have mutual love and respect in healthy relationships. All right, now what do they mean by gender I, roles? Okay, they say toxic and rigid gender roles. I'm going to be charitable here. And I'm going to, I'm I'm going to say I'm gonna I'm gonna I don't know that this is what they mean, but I'm going to assume that what they mean is, not do away with gender roles like boys having boy stuff and girls having girl stuff, but, to, well they say toxic and rigid so we're gonna say that what this means is the abuses that can take place on either side. That's I'm trying to be charitable. What, what say you? Uh, fine, whatever. <laughs> if, if we if we say that, we'll give him a point. Okay, so I'm a one point. I'm theologically, I'm egalitarian. Uh, mm -hmm. Up until a last, complementarian can affirm this. Yeah, but up until well, I'm just saying, up until last year, my wife has made more money than I have every year of our marriage, except for last year. Yeah. You know, because I married a successful woman, and then she's she's gone into semi-retirement, I guess, because she quit working at 40 uh, Does she listen ish. to this program? I'm not going to... No, but... <laughs> but I'm just saying, she's happy now. Yeah. A and then she... But So I'm saying, I I don't know what, what they're fighting against, because... Yeah. I, but if they're a fighting... A caricature. Against, a caricature. I, like, everybody is fighting against Westboro Baptist. Have at it. Fight against Westboro right, Baptist. Right, but my mom was also a stay-at-home mom and had jobs yeah. intermittently. But most of, for most of, she was a stay-at-home mom. What in the world is is that a rigid gender role that my dad and her had? That it's toxic, man. It's toxic. Well, 
No, it isn't. It's, she has to be out of the house a certain number of minutes in a day, or else you're a chauvinist. <laughs> okay. I don't know. Okay. Grief. Okay. That's ridiculous. So I'm. I'm. St- okay. So we're at two points now because yes, we believe in gender equality. That's the point. We believe in gender equality. I'm concerned about this business about doing away with toxic and rigid gender roles because obviously toxic and rigid things I want this to do away is, with. This, yeah, this is... But what I'm worried about what you mean by gender roles. Right. I, I am agree. too, because this is a this is a <laughs> insider blog site right. using those phrases that obviously communicate more than what you and I Well, might. this is on Huffington Post. Yeah. So uh, toxic masculinity... Yeah. Do you mean under, by gender roles that you should yeah. let your kid wear... Your boy wear dresses and right. stuff? So that's, that's I, I don't I, know. I don't know either. I don't know. Because they have, this, I think it's clear though what we think about all these. Things. Right, but but I'm saying these types of sites they 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 say toxic ma- masculinity without ever defining what they mean anymore because it's a it's a high context site. The people who read this nonsense know what that means. They yeah. and it probably carries with it a ton of freight. Yeah, that I don't know. Okay, so just to be clear, we are against all abuses of women by men or by other women. Or right? we're against all abuses of men by women. I know, but I feel like there's certain listeners who are going to be sensitive to this and be like, why did you say anything negative about toxic masculinity? I, I object to phraseology that is vague and used broadly in our culture that gets stuffed with stuff that I'm not sure it's what is being stuffed in there. Right. That's what I object to. But if you want to parse out specific things... We're probably the Christian, the you know, real Christian. So are we getting a point or a half a point on this? I'm giving us a full point because so we believe in gender equality. So okay, fight against homophobia. We are tired of Christian culture wars against beloved GLBTQ bearers of God's image. We want to extend love and nothing less to GLBTQ children and youth. Is we that can't, a new order of the letters now? I don't know. It's It changes. Uh, GL, yeah, GL. B-T- Gay, lesbian, so bi, trans, queer, I guess. Really? Children and youth. We can't stand to see any more of them rejected by their parents, cast out of their homes, and killed in clubs on the streets. Well, of course. Okay. I I give this a full point. Right. Full point. Yes. I, we should fight <laughs> against homophobia. Yes. And you know what? Let's I, parse it out. Sentence by sentence. Do you have a problem with this sentence? We are tired of Christian culture... Wars against beloved GLBTQ bears of God's image. No, because I, this that's phony that Christians are warring against. Okay, but technically, technically, the Westboro Baptists and similar groups do exist. So I'm trying to be as charitable as I can. Of Christian culture wars. Well, Christian is a broad. Okay, statement. do you disagree with this statement? We want to extend love and nothing less to GLBTQ children and youth. No. I agree 100%. No. You don't we, agree? We extend love and rebuke and Well, yeah, that's that's you love and more. That's they said nothing less. Oh, okay. Yeah, so okay, we have total love to them. All right. All right. Uh we can't stand to see any more of them rejected by their parents, cast out of their homes and killed in clubs or on the streets. Yeah, I agree with that. I agree 100%. So, half a point? Because yeah. they characterize the Christian culture war in a way As that, if all Christians are out there warring against a community. No, they're not warring. I'm going to give it Okay, you're giving it a half a point. I reject the fir- I reject the premise of the first sentence. Okay, and you're probably right, but I'm going to be charitable. So now I'm at a three. Here's the thing. Remember <laughs> early? Okay, remember her- earlier in the thing? Yeah. Uh, earlier in the show. Okay, I went on a big rant. Mm-hmm. Okay, we were talking about Romans one. Guess yeah. what? You know what Paul doesn't do? What? Paul doesn't. Now I want to caveat everything to death. Caveat and disclaimer and all that. Yeah. You shouldn't have to do that. Yeah. And so I'm not going to. And at the same time, we shouldn't have to caveat. Don't be terrible hateful. and hateful and bullying to anybody, including people of the now it's G. I thought it was LGB, but now the G GLBTQ. I, no, it's too much. Um, those people be nice to those people. You know what? I don't have to, I don't have to caveat that by saying, Oh, but remember to rebuke them was we, I'm tired of disclaimers. You know what? Be nice to everybody and rebuke <laughs> sin. And don't worry about, have you caveated it yeah. and disclaimered enough? Yeah. Just okay. say what you think. All right. So I gave that a full point. You gave it a half point. Okay. So far, I'm more unfundamentalist than you. That's to be expected. <laughs> You're a hip guy. All right. Eight. Strive for racial equality. Unfundamentalist parents recognize the brokenness of racial tensions and want to learn about how to dismantle systematic systemic racism, starting in our own homes with our own children. We want our children to see a representation of different race and ethnicities in children's 
lit and cultivate empathy in the experiences of those who have different skin color. Full point for me. Full point for me. All right. So Absolutely. You, yes. All right. I, I agree that we should fight against racism and systemic institutionalized racism. Absolutely. Okay, John. I don't. I've never met anyone who doesn't. I'm at four. I've never met anyone who doesn't. Well, there are for, people. I mean, I I don't know any white supremacists. Oh, I we got to move. We got to see them on TV. But okay, believe in connection yeah. over boundary making. We want to build a larger table. That not just a whoa, 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 whoa! Believe in connection over boundary making. Yeah, let me unpack it. We want to build a larger table, not a higher fence. We don't want our children to grow up afraid of those who have different religions, beliefs, and convictions, but to connect and partner with them to do good in our world. Unfundamentalist parenting is, is to not fear those who are different, but to find common ground and even learn from those beyond our own world view. All right. Now, since this is a parenting point, I think Christians should be able to deal, you know, talk with, be work with, you know, people of other worldviews. Mm -hmm. But since we're talking about kids, I know this is going to be totally unpopular, but not for me. Because right now, my kids' minds are still being formed. Mm -hmm. And uh, I know you don't want me evangelizing them, but I am. And throwing them out there with kids that have non-Christian parents and parents of other worldviews where that can influence them. No, I'm sorry. And I know there's a whole thing about I'm not one of those people that has an issue with people sending their kids to public school. That's fine. That's you got to decide that. We homeschool our kids, but this idea that I'm wrong for not sending my kids to public school because there they could be evangelists to other kids. Sorry, I'm not sacrificing my kids on the altar of the public school system and, and stuff like that uh, in order to evangelize the rest of the world. My kids are young right now, and it's 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 just as possible that they're going to be impacted by. Uh, the other voices are going to meet in, from other kids at the public school system. So for me, um, I'm saying no. When they get older, yeah, but not, and it may be partly because my kids are relatively young right now. So I give them no point. Do you give it a point? I agree with everything you said, but there's still part of me that says, I mean, you can expose them in a controlled way. Yeah, but for example, I'm a Christian apologist, but you know what? I didn't talk about apologetics or even really let them know there was atheism until they got old enough where they started figuring it out. I'll take a half point on that. You'll take I, a half I, point? I don't, I mean, I homeschool my kids and keep them away from, but yeah, but I don't, I, I'm not opposed to any exposure to that. Okay. You know? All right. 10. We read classic literature that some of it's not Christian, some of it's opposing worldview. Yeah. yeah. All right. Desire fresh imagination in old religious rituals. Despite woundedness for some of us from the religi religiosity of the, our past, we still find beauty in rituals and desire to cultivate spirituality in our children. However, we want to discard toxicity so our children have less to what unlearn. Is it? Why is it key? We want to explore imaginative ways of tapping into our connection with God through scripture, prayer, community, and exercise Christian charity. Why and the word toxicity all the time? It, what in the world? Can they not? Yeah, this vary is. This, it a little? I give no point for this because you need to tell me what in the world you mean by the, these toxic old rituals. Like you want to keep the ritual because it's cool <laughs> and, and has some kind of meaning, but you want to strip it of whatever meaning it has, and then like here, what take ritual? This. Sing hymns? No, let's not change that at all. Right. You know, I, I don't know what ritual is. They it don't like, specify. Like Catholic? Um, baptism I, I, let's get rid of ba baptism well they mentioned now. they mentioned here imaginative ways of tapping into the connection with god through scripture prayer community and exercise christian charity and service to our neighbors i don't know that's too vague no points yeah. we are not unfundamentalist parents thank god praise the lord Whoa. i'd have to use the word toxicity all the time now are there benefits? i can barely say toxicity half here's the what time. i'm for i'm you for nonviolence. i'm for rights i'm you know that people being treated equal. I'm, I'm for all that stuff. There's good stuff here. Yeah. But when you rip out some of the most important features, it doesn't work anymore. Yeah, so, so we're not unfundamentalists. Not unfundamentalists. Thank you for listening today. Check out our sister podcasts, The Bible Bro Down, Steve Gregg's Narrow Path, and Leighton Flowers, Sociology 101. We have enjoyed being with you. And check us out. Go give us a review and, and give us stars or whatever on, on iTunes. iTunes. And um, what else do I need to say? Become a student at Trinity College of the Bible right. and Theological Seminary because we are conservative, but not and, and, and we have varying doctrinal perspectives on secondary issues, but we are not unfundamentalists. Not even a little bit. See us next time on Trinity Radio. This is the last word. Age of Accountability. We were recently asked in the Trinity Radio Primetime Discussion Forum, what were the biblical arguments for and against 
The Age of Accountability. Now, there's a lot of literature on this subject, and one of the best books on it is by Adam Harwood, The Spiritual Condition of Infants. But anyone who's familiar with the arguments on both sides uh, will, will understand where I come from when I summarize my entire argument in this way. Arguments for the Age of Accountability, that God is not the most efficient practitioner of Moloch worship in existence. And the argument against the age of accountability is that God is the most efficient practitioner of Moloch worship in existence. So if you believe that God is uh, not the most efficient practitioner of Moloch worship and he really does hate it, then the idea of God pitching babies and young children into the fire uh, doesn't seem biblical to me. If you would like more content, click here and keep watching Bible Studies, click up here. And finally, we want you to subscribe. We need more subscribers, so click here.